beautiful lot to be seen in this Parsha. I mean, we're talking about when we started the book, we said that uh, the Father reveals His character, He reveals His life, and we're going to see some pretty awesome things in this uh, book, and, and this is no exception. We're going to see some amazing things in here. And I want to focus a little bit more on certain things with us and relationships in there tonight, so um, bear with me. We're going to do just a little bit, a little bit of a different twist tonight, and uh, Let's, let's, uh, let's just jump into it. And, and again, if you bear with me, um, just kind of throw this out there. Just been real short breath today, you know, so if it's taking me a little bit longer to get, to get out what I'm saying, <laughs> bear with me and uh, I'll get it. And I might, I, might not get, I might try to not be so excited. That doesn't mean that I'm not, <laughs> you know, so uh, again, so just uh, get in there with me. When we start in this Parsha, Vaeras, and I appeared, we're talking about Yahweh appearing and making himself known and making himself real to his people. And that's always an amazing thing. I mean, we, we can read about it, but when it happens in our lives, it's, it's, uh, it's just an amazing thing. Well, here Moshe, he was, he's, he's been at the burning bush, and now he's going into Mitzrayim, and they're, they're going to confront Pharaoh, and they're, and, and they're going to do all these things. But in the midst of all that, do things get better? <laughs> No, in the midst of all that, things got worse. As a matter of fact, the people got mad at Moses and said, Moses, ever since you got here, life's been harder. Go back. Leave us alone. And, and so don't lose sight of the goal. Don't lose sight of what the Father's desiring for us to do here. Okay? And Moses had to come to understand this as well. And so let's look at it. Exodus chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 6, actually. And when you read this, we're not going to go into this today, but, you know, it shows how God redeemed his people in four different ways. And uh, we've talked about this in past Parsha. We're not going to go back into that again this time. But we're going to go down, and I'm going to focus on verse 9 for a minute. Okay? So verse 9 says, Moses spoke thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. So, Moses said what God told him to say. And then it says, but the people didn't listen. You ever do what you, what you know is the right thing to do? You ever do what you know is the heart of the Father and no one listens? Or they get mad at you, right? Moses was no exception. It says, Moses spoke to the children of Israel, but they did not listen. And that leads to a question. Have you ever felt rejected when you knew you were doing the right thing? Yeah. Rejection is no, uh, no stranger to, uh, to a believer in Messiah. To, to the people of Yahweh as a whole, rejection is not a stranger to us. So, you're in good company. <laughs> if they rejected Yeshua, if they rejected the, the, the disciples, if they rejected the prophets, if they, I mean, come on. Right? It's really no different. But we need to be careful of some of this because we need to be sure that it's the word that's being rejected and not our presentation of it. You understand? See, because the word is an offense. Why? Because the word does confront you. The word does, you know, put up in front of your face, in front of a mirror and say, guys, this is where life is supposed to be. And if we're not there, you know, um, our first reaction could be, well... Who are you to tell me? Right? But we need to be careful not to go there. We need to just l read through the word. And if we need to change, we need to change. That's it. And so if we were, when we present the truth to people, how do we present it? Do we present it as, well, I know something you don't know. <laughs> or we present it as, uh, I got to tell you something so that I can appear to be smarter than you are. Or I've got to tell you something so I can put another notch in my belt that I've done something else? Or are we sharing with people because we genuinely care about the people we're sharing with? See, there is a difference. Moshe was sharing with his people. He genuinely cared about them, but they weren't listening. He was not sharing with them out of pride or arrogance or some revelation that he had at the burning bush. He wasn't rubbing their, 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 rubbing their faces in that. He was sharing the heart of the Father and what he was about to do. And the people wouldn't listen. Joseph's dreams, 
they, his, Joseph's brothers rejected Joseph. Was it because of the dreams or was it because of how he may have presented it to them? Because if you read in the Hebrew, it doesn't just read like, and Joseph said, hey guys, I had these dreams, check it out. The way it would read in the Hebrew is, you will hear these dreams that I had. And well, that's, that's a little arrogant. <laughs> and I had to get worked out of Joseph, you know? Another example, Cain. See, sometimes, and I've heard it said this way, oh, don't worry when they reject you because of they, they've rejected all greater people than you, so don't worry when they reject you. You're in good company, right? Okay, I believe that to a degree. But rejection does not equal validation. Because they may be rejecting you, not because of what you're saying, but how you're presenting it. Now, it's kind of like, I'm being persecuted at work, yeah, but not for righteousness, it's because you never come in on time. <laughs> See, there, there's a difference, right? So if we do what is right, what does Scripture say? If we do what is right, we'll be accepted, like Cain. Remember, it wasn't the offerings necessarily that Yahweh rejected, it was the people who brought them. Because the Scripture says God rejected Cain and his offering. So it wasn't just what he brought, it was his heart in bringing it. And that's what was told to him. You, if you do what is right, you will be accepted. But if not, sin lies at the door. So what is the right that we're supposed to do? I mean, are we supposed to be doing things? Is there an emphasis on doing or is it just belief? Here's the thing. Scripturally speaking, the word belief is the same word that's used for faith and is the same word, there's an action to it. It's evident. It can be seen. And so when you say you believe something, it led to an action. Not just an abstract thought. Well, I believe this. It's great in theory. When are you putting it into practice? See? These are things that we need to keep in mind. So what does feeling rejected produce? I'm going to read um, from something Batya had written. And this has been a while ago. But it's really good. And so uh, I, I want to share this with you guys. It's something Batya had written on being rejected or feeling rejected. What does it produce in a person's life? She, she writes, if we feel unloved, abandoned, or rejected, it is because we are looking to mortal men for approval. When we accept the spirit of rejection, we will strive to please those who reject us. We will want to get it right and thus be acceptable to men. Like Cain, our feeling of being rejected can lead to anger because we don't feel we should be rejected. Outbursts of anger often travel with the spirit of being downcast or depressed. And anger can be expressed in self-hatred or in hatred of others. People who entertain a spirit of rejection sometimes entertain hurtful or murderous thoughts toward themselves and or others. Let us understand that we can murder with our tongue. We can use slander or gossip to tear others down so that we won't feel alone and dejected. The spirit of rejection can cloud our thinking and cause us to misjudge others and thus withdraw from people and it can lead us to reject others because we feel they've rejected us or possibly will reject us. Restated, we use rejection as a defense mechanism. If we reject them first, they won't have the opportunity to reject us. So we need to be careful that we don't entertain thoughts like this. We do the right thing the right way. Okay? We may have good intentions, but we need to make sure that we do things properly and in order. Because just having good intentions and just wanting to do something does not necessarily mean that it's God that's doing it. Hmm. What are some examples in Scripture? Nadav and Avihu. They offered strange fire before the Lord. Well, was it acceptable to burn incense before the Lord? Absolutely. But it wasn't their place to do it. They were out of order. It was Aaron's job to do it. They brought strange fire and they died. King David, he wanted to bring the ark to Jerusalem, a noble cause. But he did it the wrong way. And someone lost their life because of it. You can do the right thing the wrong way. You can give someone the truth, but not in love. Make sure that when you deliver the truth, it's because of the love and the heart that the Father gives with it. So we have her with Moshe. The first rejection of Moshe was when he tried to deliver his brother out of his own strength. 
when he killed the Egyptian? Was his brother thankful? No. <laughs> he took off. And then later, he saw two of his brothers fighting. He said, guys, stop. And they're like, oh, you're going to kill me too? Hmm. So he tried in his own way and he was rejected, right? So it, it makes sense that he would have thoughts of rejection regarding being sent back to these same people. But God had a plan. Exodus 6, 9 again. So Moses spoke to the children of Israel, but they did not listen. Why? Because of anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. Pharaoh said, let's work them so hard that they have no time to pay attention to the things of their God. Let's make them so busy that they won't pray. Let's make them so busy that they won't take the time on Shabbat to spend with the Father and, be, be, and rest and be re, regener, regenerated. You ever been there? Being honest, yeah, we've, we've all been there. You ever been too busy to, to, read your, to read your scriptures, to read your Bible? Even just a, a chapter? Priority. The same assignment that was against the people of Israel back in that day, let's get them too busy so that they forget about their God, is still in the earth today. We need to be, be careful with those things. Because anguish of spirit and cruel bondage can cause people to not hear the promise that God is giving them. Because when we're focused on our circumstances, when we're focused on whatever it is that we're going through, when we're focused on the hurt or the pain, or we don't see you know, the light at the end of the tunnel kind of a thing, Sometimes it's easier to get through something if you know when it's going to stop. But if you don't know when it's going to stop, there's that question of, when's this ever going to end? But if you say, next week it'll all be over, I can hang in there for one more week. <laughs> See, it's, it's a perspective, right? And we need to make sure that we do not let the things of this life and the cares of this world, and when life gets hard or difficult, that we don't let that steal our relationship with the Father. Can circumstances cause you to not listen to the word of Yahweh? Yep. The two things I've got up there. One says, pay attention while walking. Your Facebook status can wait. <laughs> People walking out in front of cars. Next is the, the, the sheep. It says, I wonder why I don't hear from the shepherd anymore as he's got the TV and the radio and the headphones and the book and the computer and the, and the shepherd's back there yelling. <laughs> We can allow other things to distract us, and that will steal from us. Romans 2.5 says, Because of your hardness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of righteous judgment of God. Be careful that we do not harden our hearts towards the things of the Father. How do we harden our hearts? By being unrepentant. Do we see that continually in this, in this story where Pharaoh would not submit himself to Yahweh, therefore his heart was hardened. And it's the same with us. When we do not walk in the ways that Yahweh has given us, it will harden our heart toward him. And we need to make sure we keep a tender heart towards the Father. We must believe in Yahweh more than our circumstances, more than our experiences, more than our ideas, and more than our doubts, and more than our fears. We must believe in him. What we've learned is the things that are real are the things we don't see. Everything we see will, will pass. Everything we see will go away. The things that are real and forever and eternal are the things we do not see. And so therefore we have hope. Exodus 6.10 So the Lord said to Moses, Go in and tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But Moses says to the Lord, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am of un uncircumcised lips. Well, that's an interesting phrase. He says he's, uh, he is of uncircumcised lips. See, back at the bush, he said, I am not a man of words. Devarim. But here he doesn't say that. He's not saying, I don't know how to speak. He's, or I don't have the words to say. He's saying, I am a man of uncircumcised lips. So what does that mean? Some pretty neat stuff here. 
Biblical text speaks of two other body parts that one would not ordinarily think of as being uncircumcised. I think we all know, know what the first is. The other two are the ear and the heart. In these passages, that issue is neither deafness or a cardiac condition, but moral imperviousness in the divine word. When he says to circumcise your heart, it's not a matter of um, literally cutting something from there. It's a matter of having your heart set towards the Father and his word and his ways and letting him engrave his word into your heart. So there's, we're saying that there's something there that shouldn't be there. If we have uncircumcised lips, it's the things that we speak, our actions, the things that we, the things that we do. Are they clean? Are they pure? Are they edifying? Are they helping those around us? These are the things that this means. Exodus 6, 28 to 30. I'm going to show you some of these. And it came to pass on the day when the Lord spoke uh, unto Moses in the land of Egypt, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I am the Lord. Speak to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say to you, and the, all that I say to you. And Moses said before the Lord, Behold, I am of, of uncircumcised lips. How shall Pharaoh hearken to me? So when he's saying, I am of un- uncircumcised lips, he feels he's not worthy. He says, how can I go before Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to, you know, one-up him and tell him that the God, of, uh, the God of the Hebrews has come to me and he will destroy Egypt if Pharaoh knows my past. Pharaoh knows my failures. Leviticus 26.40 If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they trespassed against me, and also they have walked contrary to me. This is repentance, guys. That confession of sin. And that I also have walked contrary to them and have brought them to a land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised hearts are humbled. That's repentance and submitting themselves to the Father. And he says, then I will remember my covenant and I will remember the land. Jeremiah 6, 9 and 10. Thus says the Lord of hosts, he he shall uh, thoroughly glean the remnant of Israel as a vine, turn back your hand as a grape gatherer into the baskets. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is, what? Their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot hear. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them as a reproach, and they have no delight in it. When it says their ear is uncircumcised, it means that they're not willing to hear the things of God. Ezekiel 44, 6. And say to the rebellious, even to the house of Israel, it says the Lord God, O you house of Israel, let it suffice you, all of you, your abominations, in that you have brought into my sanctuary strangers who are uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh, to be in my sanctuary to pollute it. They were bringing people into the sanctuary to serve God who didn't want to serve God. So who were they serving? This bring in defilement. So we are told to circumcise our heart. And we think that that's a New Testament thing. But it was in the Torah. See, the, the, when we're told to circumcise our hearts, we're like, oh yeah, see, that's, that's in the Brihad Shah. But that concept existed beforehand. Deuteronomy 10, 16. Circumcise the foreskin of your heart. What does that mean? Don't be stubborn. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6. The Lord God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. Jeremiah 4, 4 says, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your hearts. And he tells them to repent of their evil deeds, to turn from their evil ways. Moshe, when Moshe said he had uncircumcised lips, it is not a physical disability that he has in mind, but a moral one. He is acutely aware of his lack of success so far with both Pharaoh and Israel. I failed on both counts, and you want me to go back? Yep. Because I'm not done with you. Moshe seems to say that he can't do what was asked of him because of his past. He feels he is a tainted vessel. Don't let the adversary lie to you guys. 
oh, you can't do that because look at what you used to do. Um, the key phrase is used to. Everyone has a past. I don't care who you are. We have all have sin in our lives. I don't care who you are. It's the condition of mankind. But don't let the adversary lie to you to say that who you used to be disqualifies you for who the Father is calling you to do now. Because if he's calling you to do something right now, that means he's changed you. You're not the same person that you were. You have been made new, and you can rejoice in that. Isaiah 6, 5, when Isaiah had his vision and he was before the, the, the Lord Most High, what did he say? I mean, he was a prophet of Israel and declaring uh, many things to Israel. Woe to these guys, woe to those guys. He was a prophet among the people. But when he got up before the Lord, he said, woe is me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, Lord of hosts. So what was the result? What happened? Did God say, yep, you're a low down, miserable, no good for nothing, lousy, yellow bellied. <laughs> no. God said, we'll fix that. Because of your confession, you recognize who you are before me and we're going to change that. And that's what he did. So one of the seraphim flew, having in his hand a burning coal he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Hineni shalachini. Here am I. Send me. These are words that we, should, we, we could do well to learn. If nothing else, just say this part. Hineni. Go ahead, say it. Hineni. Here am I. When we go before the Lord, sometimes it's nothing more than just to go before Him and say, Hineni. And wait. Sometimes we need to just do that. Life changes when you say, Hineni. I mean, it changed for Moshe, didn't it? The burning bush in Exodus 3, 4, he, uh, Yahweh cried out, said Moses, and Moses said, Hineni. And his life was changed. What if he got scared and ran, and kept, <laughs> kept running? 1 Samuel. Oh, yeah, this is a great story. Samuel, who was miraculously given to Hannah, and she dedicated him to the Lord. And when he became of age, after he was weaned, she gave him to Eli, the high priest, and said, you can raise him in the house of the Lord. So here, the Lord called out to Samuel, this, young, this little kid, this young boy, and he says, Hineni, and ran to Eli. Because that's who he thought was calling him. He says, here I am. And he's running to Eli, saying, you know, what you need? <laughs> he said, you called me. And Ellie said, I didn't call you. Go lay down. So he went back. And the Lord called again, Samuel, Shmuel. And Samuel arose and went to Ellie and said, here I am. You called me. He said, boy, is this some kind of trick? No, he didn't say that. <laughs> he said, um, I did not call you, my son. Go, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord or the word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. In other words, he was just young and he hadn't understood all of these things yet that would be given to him and he, he would be walking in. And the Lord called to Samuel again the third time. And he rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. <laughs> and Eli, who should have known, <laughs> it's interesting how the passage, this passage starts with Eli was getting old and blind. See, I believe that that's spiritually and physically. He was getting a little... He wasn't as sharp as he was. So when he went back this time, he said, Here I am, you called me. And Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the young man. Therefore, Eli said to Shmuel, Go, lie down. And if you hear this again, if you hear him call you again, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And Samuel went to lay down in his place. 
And the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Shmuel. And he said, Speak, for your servant hears. That's the same as saying, Hanani, here I am, I await your word. Verse 11. The Lord said to Shmuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In other words, I'm about to do some pretty amazing stuff. And you're going to be a witness to it. And when the people hear it, they're not going to believe. But you're going to see it. So Yahweh told Moshe that he was given authority over the ways and the kings of this world. And he was. I find something really interesting in the Torah. In Exodus 7, the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God the Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. Guys, that phrase, that word like, is not in the text. He literally says, I will make you God to, to Pharaoh. He says, Re'e netatecha Elohim le Pharaoh. He says, and see, I will give you, I will make you Elohim to Pharaoh. In other words, if God sent him, then he goes in God's authority. If Yahweh sent him, he goes in the authority of Yahweh. So therefore, when he stands before Pharaoh and Moshe speaks to Pharaoh, he is speaking the word of Yahweh. So he is walking in his authority. And he says, You shall speak all that I command you. And your brother Aaron shall tell tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. That's something else to keep in mind too. Just as a side note, when you read through the book, Moses didn't do a lot of the speaking in front of Pharaoh. Aaron did most of it. Just things to observe. The things you saw in the movies, (laughs) it's not the way it went down. I got to tell you, though, we used to love to watch the old uh, Ten Commandments movie when it came on, you know, the three-day-long, you know, movie. And um, I used to get the biggest kick out of it because we'd sit there and watch with the kids and we just enjoyed the kids pointing out the discrepancies. <laughs> it was really neat. When you have kids, you know, that's not what happened. And, and they can go to the scripture and tell you what happened. It's pretty neat. It's amazing. So Yahweh has given you authority. But he's also placed authority over your life. See? The question arises, how do we respond when we don't like either the person or the way that Yahweh chose to do something in our lives? Like the people of Israel telling Moses, well, who made you leader here? Well, Moses, why do we have to listen to you? Hmm? Acts 7.35 says, This Moshe, whom they rejected, saying... Who made you ruler and judge? Is the very one God sent to be both ruler and ransomer (laughs) by means of the angel that appeared to him through the thorn bush. See, when the word comes to us and it's and it's hard, it's difficult. it, It goes against what we want to believe or the way that we're generally taught to think. Our first reaction is to try to discredit the one that's talking to us. We need discernment. We need to make sure we're in the Word. Matthew 8, 5 through 10. To have authority, you have to be what? Under authority. Otherwise, you're going in your own authority. And who has to listen to you? It works in the same with governmental authority as well. Police officers. They have the authority to stand in the middle of the road and tell you to stop. And you better. If you just get a random citizen going out, stepping out in the middle of the road, they're liable to get hit. What's the difference? One has the authority to do that. The other doesn't. Uh, Matthew 8, 5. So when Yeshua entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him. He said, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worried that I have you come under my roof. But only say the word, and my servant will be healed. Say, you don't have to come to my house. 
You don't have to touch them. You don't have to do some great majestic thing to be seen from the people. You don't have to perform a sideshow. You don't have to hype anybody up. Just say the word. Just say the word. How do you understand this? When there are so many people that are going around to receive a touch from, from, from him, and he just said, you don't even have to be there. Just say it. He understood that he was speaking to the, speaking to the one that created everything by a word. He says, for I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Yeshua heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, no one in Israel have I found such great faith. Because he understood a concept of authority. And he knew he was talking to the one who had all authority. You are kingdom ambassadors, guys. We need to live as such. We need to represent the kingdom the way he wants it represented. We find, you know, whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. The problem is when we, I want to be careful how I say this because I don't want to misrepresent what I'm saying. But when we're speaking the truth and we're not speaking the truth in love and people reject the words that are being given and we say, well, they're rejecting God because they're rejecting me. No, they're rejecting you because you're acting like a madman. They're not rejecting the word, they're rejecting your delivery. We need to be careful with that. You know, it's funny, I, I, <laughs> I hate to go back there, but it's a classic example. I mean, just look on Facebook. How many back and forth lines does it take before they start name calling? Why can we, why, can, why do we, I mean, it's just a disagreement. Why can we not just talk about the facts, talk about the things, without resorting to, you're stupid. <laughs> We, we back in the playground in kindergarten again or what? Matthew 10.40 Whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Luke 9, 46. An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. Well, uh, there goes that pride again, right? But Yeshua, knowing the reasoning of the hearts, took a child and put him by his side. And he said, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. Notice he didn't say whoever has their theology perfect. John 13, 20. Truly I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Yeshua sent his Talmudim. Who sent Yeshua? The Father. Ezekiel 3, 10. Son of man, all my words that I shall speak to you, receive in your heart and hear with your ears. And go to the exiles, to your people. Go to where? The exiles. And to your people and speak to them and say, thus says the Lord God, whether they hear or refuse to hear. See, that's the thing. God is saying, if I ask you to do something, you do it no matter what their response is going to be. Because we can talk ourselves out of being obedient. Well, God said do that, but buddy, they're not going to like that. And then this is going to happen, and that's going to lead to this and the other thing. And we develop this grand scheme of, in our mind of how it's going to go down. And we choose to not be obedient. Ezekiel 3.17 Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way in order to save his life, that wicked person shall die for his iniquity, but his blood will be required at your hand. But if you warn the wicked, and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall die for his iniquity, 
but you will have delivered your soul. 20. Again, if a righteous person turns from his righteousness and commits injustice, and I lay a stumbling block before him and he shall die, because you have not warned him he shall die for his sin, and his righteous deeds that he has done shall not be remembered, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the righteous person not to sin, and he does not sin, he shall surely live, because he took warning, and you will have delivered your soul. This doesn't mean we have to go out there and shake everyone when we're just to talk to them. It means we need to be sensitive to the Father, and when he speaks, you do. It's not just random speech that we're supposed to do, guys. What are we supposed to be speaking? Life. Proverbs 15.23 says, People take pleasure in anything they say, but a word at the right time. How good it is. If we deliver the right word the right way, it'll change people's hearts and lives. And that's the way it should be. If we're truly listening to the heart of the Father, walking in His ways, we can express that to those around us. And it won't only change us. Could we actually change the world? It's been done before. Ain't no reason why it can't happen again. That's what we're shooting for. May it be. In Yeshua's name. Let's all stand.